presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. And if we begin to take a novel like the ones I write and like who I am, and we say, well, those belong to the sort of immigrant category, then I wonder what's left that belongs to the American category. Because for me, the American category is that immigrant category. Coming up on Dialogue, a conversation with novelist Danao Mengestu about truth, about memory, and about what it means to be an American. That's Dialogue next. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome to Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. My guest today came to the United States from Ethiopia at the age of two. Raised in Peoria, Illinois, Danao Mingestu knew from an early age he wanted to write. When he did, he infused his tales with characters and storylines from both Africa and Mid-America. Mingestu is the author of three novels so far, The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears, How to Read the Air, and All Our Names. He's received acclaim for his work, including a MacArthur Fellowship, the so-called Genius Grant. I spoke with Mangestu at the 2015 Sun Valley Writers' Conference. Since 1995, the conference has been bringing together both well-known and up-and-coming authors for discussions about literature and life. Well, welcome to Idaho. I understand you went on your first fly fishing trip. I did. I did. I was amazing. <laughs> you, bought, you, you caught one this big? I, well, I, I saw one this big, and, and we, we made a mutual agreement that he would say where he was in the water, I would say where I was, and we'd tell the story together. He would say, I almost caught a man this big, and I would say, I almost caught a fish this big. Well, maybe something you can use in a, in a future story. Yeah. You know, I was really moved by your book, The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears, because it's set in Washington, D.C., where I grew up. Yeah. And seeing my hometown through the eyes of your narrator really brought back a lot of memories and introduced me to some new aspects of my hometown. This was a book that you set there because you had been living there, yes? Yeah, and it was, um, it was a place that I started going to at a, at a pretty young age when after my family immigrated to America. Um, my uncle moved to D.C. when I was still pretty young, so I started going to D.C. Um, when I was about seven or eight, and, and I remember just being really struck by, by, by both the city as a place and, and as an idea, um, enough so that, that I, you know, when I went to college, I really wanted to go to D.C., um, again, partly for the same reasons, the place of D.C. as the capital of the country, and just also the way it sort of looks to me. I always thought of it as a pretty striking and beautiful city. You know, it's interesting, though, your characters um, who have immigrated from Africa, they're kind of over it, which I yeah. think is really interesting. It's not such a rah-rah, patriotic, no. American dream experience. They look at the monuments now and just kind of walk past them. And I think that's probably very realistic. We tend to... Yeah. Well, cause I, well I think we're always coming into conflict with the sort of... Um, with the ideas that our country represents and the sort of reality that we actually experience. You know, and there's lots of wonderful, beautiful ideas that DC and of course America, I think as a whole, embody, but we don't always get to fulfill those ideas. And, and oftentimes immigrants are the ones who, prior to arriving to America, they oftentimes um, are the most profound believers in those ideals. They believe in those ideals as actually being things that they will experience and will realize almost as soon as you step foot onto the ground. And in fact, that's not true. You know, the American dream, um, we posit it as being the sort of thing that we all have access to and, and we can possibly have access to it, but it's not something that's guaranteed. And I think what happens with characters is they have to, um, they have to meet that sort of terrible reality that the real world and the sort of version of the world we wish we live in aren't always the same. The title comes from Dante's Inferno, yeah. which is interesting. The beautiful things that heaven bears. And, he's seeing a little bit of heaven. Yeah, and 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 it's and it's it's lovely because it's you know he's Dante's traveled through through Inferno. He's gone through Hell, um, and it's like the, the sort of you know Virgil knows he needs some respite, but he doesn't get to sort of actually see what heaven actually is. You know, and there's an ambiguity in that. Rather than actually naming what those beautiful things are, they remain the sort of amorphous things. There are these um, the unknowable beauty that you know lies waiting for you but you're not quite there yet. It's that sort of in-between phase, which I think is pretty um, emblematic of what a lot of immigrants' experiences are. You know, they've oftentimes have, have survived and endured pretty, pretty difficult things in their lives, 
and you get to a new country like America or, or wherever else may be, and your life hasn't fully resettled itself. Uh, you know, you haven't necessarily formed the community. You haven't overcome all the loss and tragedy that you may have experienced. But you know that capacity is still there, perhaps not even for yourself, but for your children. And so you, you know, I think I, I felt like it, it worked well for who my characters were. People have asked you about your protagonists, yeah. are mostly from Africa. You came to this country when you were two from Ethiopia. So many people have you know, put you in that box of, of writing immigrant yeah. literature. It's not one, though, that you feel comfortable with. Well, I, I totally I, comfortable yes, with. Yeah. Parts of it, yes. Yeah. Well, definitely, of course, because I, I, the fact that my characters are immigrants, of course they are, um, you know, as my parents are, as, as, as I am. Um, so it's not that I'm uncomfortable with the idea of, of what an immigrant is, but that I'm comfortable with our segregation of our literature into factions. Um, that the immigrant experience is the American experience. And if we begin to take a novel like the ones I write and like who I am, and we say, well, those belong to the sort of immigrant category, then I wonder what's left that belongs to the American category. Because for me, the American category is that immigrant category. So if you're factioning it off, it's not so much because those are immigrant stories, but because those are stories that we may think don't fully f integrate themselves into our idea of what an American narrative is. And I'm uncomfortable with that segregation, with saying that these stories belong here and then over here, if I, all my characters were in Connecticut, that that would be the more American version of, of a narrative, right? And I'm like, no, those are, Connecticut stories are just as real and a part of an American story as the story of three young men who have come from Africa and are living in Washington, D.C. What could be more American than that, if anything else? And as I mentioned, the experiences in your books can be universal in many instances. I'd like yeah. if you don't mind for you to read a passage that I found particularly beautiful yeah, along pleasure. those lines. Um, so the narrator, Seifa Stefanos, um, immigrated from Ethiopia and runs a small grocery store in Washington, D.C. And the, the strongest relationship that he probably has in his life is with a young girl named Naomi who walks into his store one day and, um, and the two form a sort of, um, almost a sort of father-daughter relationship, um, a lot of which is based on reading to each other. So this is a brief passage from them. Every time I looked at Naomi, I became aware of just how seemingly perfect this time was. I thought about how years from now I would remember this with a crushing, heartbreaking nostalgia, because of course I knew even then that I would eventually find myself standing here alone. And just as that knowledge would threaten to destroy the scene, Naomi would do something small, like turn the page too early or shift in her chair, and I would be happy once again. So it's just a moment in time. He's looking and he's thinking this is just the perfect moment. A little bit of heaven is yeah. coming, shining through, but then he's also realizing that eventually it will end. And that's a universal yeah, very much experience, so. not yeah. just an immigrant experience. Yeah. I just thought it was beautiful and that relationship between him and the, and the little girl. Um, many of your books have these, it, it, her, the little girl's mother uh, is white yeah. and he starts falling in love with her, and several of your books have this relation, biracial yeah. relationship uh, in them. Why is that something that you were drawn to to put in your books? Um, I think some of the ways, it's, it's one of the ways of trying to figure out how, um, how we're divided as a society and as a culture. You know, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of great sort of progress America has made since you know, the end of the Civil Rights era, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we've come to any meaningful conversation about the differences in race and class in America. Um, and so in this novel you have a man like Seifa and, and Naomi's mother who are, um, who are very different but at the same time share a lot in common. They're two people who are, who are searching for a home and searching for a place in the world. And they're divided not only by the color of their skin but by the differences in their economic class. Seifa's an immigrant. He has a, a failing grocery store. Naomi's mother Judith is an academic with you know sort of a very middle upper middle class life. And you can begin to see the fissures in their relationship emerge, not because they can't understand each other, but because they feel um, they almost like a vocabulary to say, um, this is why we're sort of different, right? These are the sort of things that divide us. And if we can't figure out how to actually openly say those things, how can a relationship sort of actually endure? You know, and I think definitely growing up in the Midwest and, and seeing a lot of sort of like having friends who were sort of white and black and minorities, and then realizing that as we grew older, um, the differences in our color and the color of our skin mattered more than we thought. And they matter especially when our relationships are intimate. 
So you might be able to have friends who are the same gender as you, but what happens when that intimacy crosses a lot those lines? What happens when suddenly you're asked to do more than just tolerate another human being, which is sometimes all we ask of each other is to tolerate. And that seems like a very low threshold. Yes, and in all our names uh, in that biracial um, relationship, the young woman who's a social worker yeah. and she's fallen in love with her, her client who's from Africa, she thinks, well, I'm going to go into a diner and I'm going to... Uh, we're going to have a meal together, yeah. and I don't care what anybody thinks and says, and they probably won't notice anyway, and they do notice. Of course. It's extremely uncomfortable. She wants to flee. I won't tell the, yeah. the viewers what happens because I want them to read the book, but um, in the end, the, the man says, no, I'm staying, but he tells her, you know, this is how they break you slowly in pieces. Yeah. Which is, which, is, which is a difference than, um, I think sometimes maybe now we're at a better point in, in beginning to understand just how deeply affected our communities are by, our, by divisions in race. Because we think because we've taken down the signs, we've changed our vocabulary, that somehow we live in a more equitable world. And in fact, that's not necessarily true. You know, we begin to feel those small bands of discrimination in more distinct and particular ways. And they never went away. They just changed the rhetoric and they sometimes changed the vocabulary. Um, and so rather than sort of walking into a store and realizing you can't sit at the counter, you're, um, you're almost dismembered in smaller, more subtle forms. Um, the civil rights movement did a lot to legislate away discrimination and voting rights and housing rights. But something else remained problematic in our societies. And now is our chance, I think, to finally say that. And one that you will continue writing about? Yeah, I think it's something that's, um, I think those divisions in our societies are integral to what I think of myself as doing as a writer, not only from the immigrant experience, but um, just from the kind of complexity of our culture that we live in. And it's a wonderful culture. It's one of the great things about America is that we have these multicultural societies where, you know, I grew up with Vietnamese, best with a Vietnamese, Colombian, Peruvian childhood best friends, and all of us lived on the same block. Um, but it means our cultures are more complex and our society is more divided sometimes than we want to be able to see it as. Your dialogue I found very believable, e even the dialogue coming from women and, and, and the little girl, which I have to say as a woman yeah. isn't always the case when I, when yeah. I read well, thank you. <laughs> dialogue coming, you know, written by a yeah. man about uh, a woman. Is that from an observe, observer standpoint, do you, do you sit and listen? to conversation or is it something that you're just naturally born um, with? I definitely don't think I'm naturally born with much. much. I think it's a lot of it is, um, is, is one feeling how close you are to your characters anyway. Like how necessary are they to me and either they walk into the story and they feel alive to me or they don't. And if I can't feel them, like Naomi in the passage I, from the book I just read, she walked into the story almost the same way she walks into the novel and as soon as she walked in I heard her voice, um, Helen in the, all our names. Um, for her, to, as soon as I began to feel like I was seeing the world really through her eyes, I knew who, what her voice was. And the question of, of a character's voice and the authenticity of that, I think, is really a question of um, how necessary is that character to the story and how closely are you really watching the world through their eyes. I also uh, really appreciate the fact that you have set several of your books in mid-America, Peoria, yeah. where you spent time yourself. Um, because in point of fact, a lot of immigrants and refugees are coming to places like Peoria, they're oh, coming yeah. to Boise, Idaho, yeah. they're coming to Twin Falls, Idaho, um, because these are areas seen by the federal government yeah. as more a place where people can get jobs yeah. and the cost of living is a little bit less, there's a lot of faith groups to help. So I thought it was great that, yeah. you know, it wasn't, you have one book set in New York, but the other oh, two are not. Yeah, um, and, th you know, that's my family's experience. When we came to America, we were, um, I think my father was actually initially resettled in New York, but there was um, friends of friends of friends of friends in Peoria, Illinois, and a better job opportunity. And when we arrived there, there weren't that many, if any, Ethiopian immigrants around. Um, but, you know, it allowed us to grow up with a very strong sense of what it meant to grow up in a very sort of, like, typical American environment. Um, and at the same time, I think for my work, it's, it's, um, it's great to feel like you have access to this part of the country that oftentimes um, isn't seen for its the sort of like di range of diversity and the complexity that it offers us. Well, it's kind of fun. I, you know, Boise's been growing. Yeah. And I remember hearing people say, you know, we, don't, we need a, 
couple things. One is, you know, like a Whole Foods or whatever. <laughs> and then people would say, and an Ethiopian restaurant. <laughs> when we have an Ethiopian <laughs> restaurant, we'll, we'll truly it. have arrived. Yes. And we actually have a first Ethiopian yeah. restaurant. And Tef, I know, which the is grain grown is actually Idaho. grown I in know. Idaho, yeah. which is used in Ethiopian um, bread in Jera. In, in, in Jera. In Jera. Yeah. Um, so, you know, point of fact that it, America is becoming more diverse and yeah. people are being introduced to these foods and they want them no matter yeah. where they live. Yeah. Okay. And I, I think the wave of diversity, you know, we sort of oftentimes think of it as being concentrated in these sort of, on these sort of two different coastlines. Um, but for a long time, it's been spreading itself out across the country, you know, and it's been, I think, hopefully most of the time, it's been actually like, enriching the sort of range of what it meant to sort of be um, American. You know, we oftentimes think of a place as Peoria or Idaho as being um, defined very under very sort of strict homogenous lines, but they're not actually. You know, the very idea of America is kind of predicated on its ability to expand and to sort of um, take on other cultures and fold them into this sort of natural to the under the fabric of this country. And that means that fabric isn't bound by one cultural norm, by one ethnicity, by the color of one person's skin, by one type of food. We sort of grow larger with every new community that comes into our neighborhood. There are experiences, though, that can be only understood by refugees that thankfully yeah. aren't universal because um, the trauma that's experienced, we wouldn't want everybody yeah. to have to experience that. And I'd like, like you to read another passage that I found very poignant um, from the beautiful things yeah. that heaven bears. You know, so from most of the novel, the narrator has been trying to, I think, hide from um, the reasons why he left Ethiopia and what brought him to America. And, um, and I think it's at this moment in the novel where he's beginning to come to terms with the death of his father and is actively remembering what happened to his father before he lost him. And he's been spending time on a couch, we should yeah. say. So. Um, I saw my father's face just before three soldiers in tattered uniforms escorted him out of our house. I never saw what death did to his face whether or not it aged it, or perhaps even restored it to some long vanished peaceful state. I did imagine it involuntarily while lying awake and staring across the living room to the glass doors that led out to the balcony. I sometimes imagined leaping off. In my mind, his face was untouched, free from any bruises or scars the soldiers might have left, his eyes, nose, and mouth po impossibly perfect. I gave him a wonderful funeral, complete with all of the rites the dead deserve a body, casket, and flowers, along with a priest and cast of mourners who followed him all the way to his family's burial ground just outside of Addis. All of that happened on that couch. And uh, it was a very, it was a violent death yeah. um, described in more detail later. Um, again, this is part of the immigrant or refugee experience, I should say. Uh, something that is not universal, but something yeah. that I think is described in your books very well. It's a trauma. Yeah, it is, definitely. You know, and, and I think I've often said that, um, you know, immig the immigrant story, if anything, is, one, is a story of loss. And just, it's universal qualities that everyone knows what it means to lose something and to lose someone. But the immigrant narrative oftentimes takes that into, uh, and it magnifies it dramatically into a much more... Um, traumatic narrative sometimes and and that's a definite version of that we've everyone's lost somebody that they love but not necessarily under such violent circumstances it's also about memory and and your book seemed to me to have that running through um, the the book that uh, Naomi and Sefa were reading was the brothers Karamazov and you have a, a great quote in there yeah. that he tell that he wants to tell Naomi it says people talk to you a great deal about your education but some good sacred memory mm -hmm preserved from childhood is perhaps the best education. If a man carries many such memories with him into life, he is safe to the end right. of his days. And if one has only one good memory left in one's heart, even that may sometimes be the means of saving us. Yeah. So much is about memory in your, in your book because it's often all that yeah. somebody has left. Yeah, and, and even within the passage I just read, um, you know, you can see the narrative act, the narrator actively um, creating a memory that doesn't really exist. You know, he's not there to watch his father, um, to watch his father get buried. And so instead, he has to sort of invent it because there's, we need our we need our memories preserved and we need them stored. And sometimes we're denied access to those events, but we can still, um, like the in the way memories and the construction of fiction intertwine themselves seems pretty. Um, yeah, it's a very essential part of I think what, why why I love literature. <laughs>
And lies, too. You yeah. write about lies. <laughs> People telling that. lies. Some beautiful lies, some bad lies. Yeah, Yeah, but that's also a, a theme because as we reconstruct things or construct things, sometimes embellishments happen or what we want to, to have happen happen, happens. It's yeah. And I mean, you know, like when I was writing the scene of the narrator's father's death, um, you know, really quickly I realized I was also imagining the death of my uncle during, during the revolution in Ethiopia. And it was a death that nobody in our family was actually able to witness. He was taken away to prison and died one day, um, and no one was there to see why or how he died. Um, and to some degree, writing this novel was a way of kind of stepping back into that history and saying, um, we weren't there, we didn't see it, but let's, um, it's still present in our lives. The, the memory of that event haunts our family, and let's give it a face, let's give it a shape and a name. And there's something beautiful that can arise out of that. And then, of course, there are you know, the other parts of fiction that can be pr problematic, the, the ways in which we're unable to face reality. And some of my characters are, are flawed because they choose to sort of um, to invent other possibilities than the ones that they actually live. That's right, yeah, yeah. Really interesting. Um, have you always wanted to write? Uh, um, yeah, yeah, I'd say from a pretty, I mean, I've always loved to read. Um, and I think I began taking, I began thinking of writing as something that I loved when I was still in high school. I don't think I had the courage to say that I wanted to be a writer until like a week before I published my first book. Um, it's something that, you know, you, I did for a very long time, but it's also, um, I did out of such admiration for the books that I love and the writers that I grew up reading and, the, and um, that to think that you could sort of do what they did, you know, and that you could have the same impact just seemed sort of very unlikely. And you, you read and you found these moments of beauty inside of a story and you thought, um, wouldn't it be great to be able to, to participate in that, to share in that? When did that tipping point happen where you plunged yourself into that and into, into started writing yeah. with Ernest? Um, I'd say even at the same age, I just kept it secret. Um, and it was nice to do it that way, you know, like by 16, 17, I was spending most of my time in coffee shops by myself, um, scribbling away notebooks and, um, and probably, you know, probably fantasizing about doing an interview like this, I'm sure. Um, but, I, you know, but it was nice to keep those things as those fantasies were separate from the thing that I really loved the most, which was, um, which was reading and then trying to create stories out of what I just read. What is the relationship, if any, between African writers um, who come to the, um, the United States more recently, like yourself, and African-American writers who've yeah. been here for a long time, you know, centuries. Yeah. Um, I mean, for me, it's been, it's been pretty indis indispensable. I'd say um, I'm as influenced, if not maybe more influenced, by African-American writers than I have been by sort of post-colonial African writers. Um, you know, I've, I've read and reread most of James Baldwin's work. Um, contemporary African American writers like Toni Morrison or Edward P. Jones have been um, absolutely essential to what I, to what I do as a writer and to how I think of myself and um, and not and, you know there's a big divide in our experiences. I've I often think you know African immigrants we've come here pretty recently because there was a great African American um, history in this country that made the possibility of that migration happen that we could come here without the discrimination. But at the same time, we know what the experience of being black in America is. And, and, you know, you read Edward P. Jones writing about Washington, D.C., and I have an incredible insight and memories that feel very personal, even though they're not my own, of that black experience in D.C. that feels important to me. But my characters are quite different from his, too. What is the status of uh, African writing right now, either in diaspora or in country? I know you were named one of the Africa 39, yeah. which is a prestigious, and there's a, the Kane Prize, which... You know, somewhat controversial, yeah. but but um, are we seeing a renaissance or a yeah. growth in writers think, from Africa? I think we're, we're I think we're witnessing the um, the benefits of another generation. You know, I think the generation of my parents um, they were it was harder for them to tell the stories that they needed to tell because most of the time that's when Africa sort of suffered a lot of its most extreme um, political upheaval and. The generation that's writing now, oftentimes, are the ones who get to come after that, and we're writing in the wake of those experiences. And so we have an we have an enormous wealth of stories that need to be told. And so if there is, I wouldn't think, I don't think of it so much as a as a renaissance so much as 
our kind of obligation to this, you know, to the generation that preceded us. Um, we're telling the story not only of Africa, but of also of migration and diaspora. So you read, think of somebody like Chimamanda or No Violet or, or, or Teju, um, and we're all writing sometimes to some degree about America and about Africa, and we're oftentimes also looking back on experiences that preceded our own. We're looking back on the wars and the conflicts and the upheaval that preceded us by, you know, 20, 30 years when we were still children because they continue to be part of our own lives. The publishing world, though, is still overwhelmingly white, isn't it? Yes, deeply. I think Juno Diaz once said, it's, it's so white it hurts your teeth. <laughs> Just a very perfect way of saying it sometimes, yeah. Um, I don't think we're definitely, I don't think we've reached the point of, of diversity that honestly reflects what America is yet. And that's also, I think, always a bit frustrating where, um, you know, and it, some of it's definitely we need, it's what comes first. Do, do we have more writers tell the stories and hope that people will come along? And I think publishing is probably always a little bit late. You know, I remember before publishing my first book, a friend who worked in publishing told me, no one wants to read the story of, about an African guy in America. And, um, you know, and we talk about all the great African writers, younger African or African American writers who are present today, that shows that's completely wrong, that there was a lot of people who want those to hear those stories, and they're not just African immigrants, they're not, the, they're not just our parents. Um, hopefully they're people in Boise, Idaho, who want to read those stories because they realize they're part of those narratives as well. So do you consider yourself a political writer? Um, yes, I do. Um, I think of, and I think of the political writing as being the most expansive possibility of what the politics means. It's, um, it means somebody who writes about all the different complexities that characters can live in, you know, not just their hearts may break because they love somebody, but also in the context of loving somebody, there's an economic reality and there's a political reality and there's a social reality and there's a cultural reality. And as much as possible, I want all those experiences to be brought into my stories. I don't want my characters to live in a world that feels strangely distilled and homogenized. Um, the world I think we live in is pretty complex, you know, um, and I want that complexity to be there for, for my characters and, and for my readers. Otherwise, how else can they find themselves inside of the story? Um, Do you know what's next for you, what you're working on? Um, I, you, you always, well, you, <laughs> you think you know, and I, you have vague ideas of what the story is going to be, um, but oftentimes it'll prove itself to be something completely different. So. Um, you know, I'm in the very, very early stages of the next book, but it's in those early stages where if you can say it's right now, it's about, um, it's about Connecticut, and in the end it'll end up being about vampires, and you have no idea where the story will actually go, but um, yeah. Right now, those are some of the themes? No, right now. <laughs> okay. No. Um, Let's not put that out there yes. then, right? <laughs> no, no, no vampires are Connecticut so far. Yeah. <laughs> a vampire in, a vampire in, in Connecticut. Connecticut Court or Yankee that, Court? That might be the best-selling book I'm waiting to get out there, actually. <laughs> well, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me. No, I thank really you. It appreciate it. And you. continue to enjoy Idaho and have yeah. some fish tales. I know. I mean, one more time. The next, I think the second time or third time is the is the charm for the good fish story. You've been listening to novelist Danao Mengestu. To learn more about him, check out the Dialogue website. Just go to idahoptv.org and click on Dialogue. That's also where you can watch our interviews from the Sun Valley Writers Conference dating back to 2005. My thanks to the organizers of that conference for letting us talk with their insightful speakers. For Dialogue, I'm Marcia Franklin. Thanks for tuning in. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho.